Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual celebration of International Women's Day at Kansas City University. You know, we began celebrating International Women's Day in 2019. So this is our third consecutive year of recognition. International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievement of women. This year's theme is Choose to Challenge, committing to challenge gender bias and inequality and forging an inclusive world together where we celebrate women's achievements. Building an inclusive culture remains a top priority for Kansas City University, and it depends on all of us, faculty, staff, and administration. So I'm glad to see so many of you join this presentation here today. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, KCU alum, Dr. Renee Volney Darko. Dr. Darko graduated from Kansas City University with a DO degree and a Master of Business Administration in Healthcare Leadership from Rockhurst University. She's a board certified obstetrician gynecologist and the founder and CEO of Pre-Med Strategies through which she offers medical school recruiters and diversity officers creative solutions to increase their engagement with underrepresented minority students in medicine and pre-med students as well. Dr. Darko serves as a mentor for the Tour for Diversity in Medicine and participates in international medical missions in Ghana, West Africa for an organization focused on women's health. A staunch advocate, Dr. Darko has dedicated her life's work to improving global women's health and achieving equity, diversity, and inclusion in medical education. Please join me in a virtual round of applause as we welcome Dr. Darko to today's celebration. Dr. Darko. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Hahn. I know you're on here, even though that was pre-recorded. I know that you're you're here with us today, and I want to thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you um, for inviting me to speak, um, Desi, uh, Dr. Durgens. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, and um, thank you for recognizing International Women's Day. I mean, it's it's a it's a very important holiday. Um, I know this is the third year that KCU is celebrating. So hopefully this is the third of many more celebrations to come. So I, you know, I'm going to share my screen. Um, one of the things that I talked about with Dr. Durgens and with Desi is that, you know, with all of the Zoom, uh, meetings that we've been having recently, it is so very easy to get zoomed out, <laughs> right? And so what I feel um, really is a good presentation is actually more of a discussion. And I know that there are many of us here, um, but I don't think that that should necessarily um, stop us from having a robust discussion. And so rather than me just being a talking head uh, for the next hour or so, um, I would love to engage in discussion with you um, about this topic today. Um, so it is International uh, Women's Day. Um, however, I'm going to be speaking to you from my own experience, right, as a Black woman in, in medicine. And um, certainly that is relevant uh, to just you know, medicine in general. Um, we know that Black women make up just over about 2% um, of the physician workforce. Uh, thankfully, you know, the numbers of Black women being admitted into medical school does see some, some gains. Um, we would like to see more, uh, but certainly, you know, we, we know that there are many contributions that come from Black women in medicine. Now, while we do celebrate contributions, one of the things that I think is really important is to understand kind of history and truth, right? And so today, what we're going to do is I'm, I'm actually going to engage you in a discussion that might actually make 
some of you feel very uncomfortable, right? And so the question becomes, you know, how do we move past, you know, the times that we are experiencing? How do we move past the experiences um, that we're currently having um, in this country? And some of that comes with having a level of discomfort, um, but an informed conversation um, where we feel that we can have this, we can have this discomfort, we can have this conversation, um, but we are having it for the sake of learning and being able to make things better. So, um, so with that, I will, I will keep going. So, you know, there's the rallying cry, right? We are all women, right? Except for the men, obviously you're not women, <laughs> right? But we all, you know, as women, we tend to say, you know, we, we're all women and, you know, we should band together and we should stick together. And, you know, our issues are very much the same. And the answer is not quite, right? Not quite. Certainly we are all women. But when we are looking at the lens, um, you know, of womanhood, um, from different races, di different ethnicity, ethnicities, different um, religions even, right? There are differences, okay? There are major differences um, in the lens from which we look as well as the lens in which people see us, okay? So while oftentimes when we talk about, let's say women's rights, oftentimes that's seen with a lens that you know, for white women might be one thing, but for black women might mean another. And so what I mean by that is oftentimes black women feel that we have to look at our gender in context of our race, whereas white women may not necessarily have to do that, right? They think of themselves as, as women, right? For the most part. Um, we even see that in television shows, for example, right? If you see a television show, um, you talk, you know, you, you watch a television show and oftentimes, you know, if it's a predominantly white um, show with, with predominantly white characters, they just tell their stories from their perspective. But oftentimes if you're looking at a show that isn't necessarily predominantly white, um, that has, you know, black women in it or, you know, uh, Latino women, Oftentimes, there always is a mention, right? There, there is the qualification that this is from a Black point of view or a Latina point of view. Like there's always that mention, right? There isn't just the assumption that just because the show is on television and um, is portraying uh, the, the experience of this person who happens to have a certain ethnicity, there isn't just that assumption. That it has to be mentioned. Um, so even in, in like small nuances like that, that you may say, well, you know, I don't think that that's such a big deal. But when you're the person who always has to qualify, it does become a big deal um, because you understand the importance of that context um, as, you, as you navigate through life. And so today I'm gonna to be talking, I mean, we could talk about black women's experiences in history till we're blue in the face and we could be here for literally 50 days, um, but we're not gonna be here for 50 days <laughs> because we don't have 50 days. So I kind of just went through and said, okay, well, what are some things perhaps that you know maybe I might be able to bring to light um, for people to see, okay, what do we know about this history um, and what do we know about how this history affects the way black women may navigate um, just through the world, through this country and, and in medicine. Um, and, and what does that mean for us um, in terms of engaging um, with black women, either engaging with each other or black women engaging with others of different races and ethnicities. And so the five areas that I'm going to touch upon again, I'm not going to be a talking head much longer. I'd love to engage you in this conversation, um, but we're gonna be talking about black women on display, um, objectification for the advancement of medicine, um, whether or not the, object the objectification is worth it, um, 
stereotypes and who's deserving and then black women in medicine actually okay so i'm not going to be talking about a bunch of doctors and you know all the great things that they've done certainly there are many uh black women physicians who have done amazing things but i think we need to take a, a little bit of a step back so that we can look at the history and what that means um to us as black women and then what that means to us as a country in general so Here's a question. How many, how many of you, even in the chat, if you put in the chat, although I don't even know that I can see the chat at this point, but how many of you have seen something or heard of something to the effect of Black women basically saying, don't touch my hair? How many of you have seen something like that? I don't even know if I can go to the chat, but if I can, let's see. Uh, can I go to the chat? I don't think I can see the chat, but yeah, I don't think I you got that. lots of yeses coming in on the chat. Got it. Okay, yeah. Somebody tell me what I have coming in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brendan. Excellent. So lots of yeses, right? Like, don't touch my hair, right? And so where does that come from, right? Because, you know, for the most part, I don't necessarily think that I've ever seen uh, white women, Latina women, you know, Asian women walking around saying, don't touch my hair, don't touch my hair. And so th there's a, you know, there is a very deep seated history behind hair that I'm going to get into. But what happens is that black women's hair oftentimes becomes the subject of commentary, of interest, um, of something that, you know, people are just so fascinated with. Um, and sometimes it can be distracting, right? There are even sometimes policies that are made, let's say in the military or you know, in, in private institutions where essentially your hair has to be a certain way. And because black women's hair tends to be the texture that it is, sometimes they can't get that hair, their hair that way unless they do something very drastic to modify it. And so oftentimes you'll have even uh, black women who will go to an interview um, for either med school or a job and they feel that they have to whiten their hair, meaning that they have to straighten it. They have to make it less, they just have to make it less, right? Like less, um, you know, in your face, if you will, right? Because that's oftentimes how people see it. Like, oh my gosh, like she has so much hair. Um, so, you know, the don't touch my hair comes into play because oftentimes there are, there, and I've been subject to this myself actually, where someone will literally just come up to you and just, grab at your hair and so there's this thing of okay well why you know why are you doing that like why are you in my personal space what makes you think that you actually have the right to do that and so where does this come from right where does this come from why why do we have that sensitivity number one but number two where does the almost um right or the thought that you could go and grab someone's hair actually come from um, and so I, I, I would argue that some of that is actually cultural and passed down very in a very nuanced way. And I don't know how many of you are aware, how many of you are aware that there were human zoos, not just in this country, but actually around the world that there were human zoos. Breton, help me out again. <laughs> let me know go ahead and put in the chat how many of you were aware that there were actually human zoos where they actually put uh not just black women but black men as well and children on display we have a mix of yes and no's coming in quite a few no's okay quite a few no's okay and so so where does this come from right and one thing that you have to understand is that when we go to school, we all tend to go to the same schools, right? And we learn history in the way that it is taught in schools. And so we are, we are taught to, you know, regurgitate the history exactly the way that it's taught in school. But what you also have to understand is that culturally, you know, as African Americans and people of African descent, we are often taught not just the history in school, but the history of our own people outside of just slavery and Martin Luther King, right? Like, because that tends to be the extent um, of which we, you know, we tend to um, teach children uh, about, you know, African-American history or African history in general. 
And so, yes, there, there were actually some, there were, there was actually something called a human zoo. And on the left, this particular uh, picture here depicts Sarah, Sarah Bartman. Sarah Bartman um, was from South Africa. She lived in the 1700s into the 1800s. And um, she was actually brought to different zoos to be put on display by none other than a physician named um, William Dunlop. Um, he was a European uh, physician. I can't remember exactly from which country in Europe, but she was put on display in uh, England as well as in France. And so, you know, people were allowed to basically gawk at her, touch her, um, really look at her physique because it was so different than anything that they had seen before. And so here you can see that um, she, her remains were actually put on display. So that skeleton that you're seeing was actually put on display um, at a museum. I believe, I think it was the Museum of Natural History. Don't quote me on that, but... Um, and then the, you can see here, her body habitus was recreated um, to show, you know, now her skeleton looks like this, but her body habitus actually um, look, looked the way that it is here. And so that was up until 1974 that that display had actually gone on. So, you know, when you think about it, you're like, man, 1974, that's a very long time to hold on to someone's skeleton um, and then to have a recreation of their body habitus. Um, but eventually her remains were taken back to South Africa and she was given a, a proper burial, but that was again in the mid 1970s. Um, and then here on, on the right, you, you see that the human zoo um, basically depicts a young black girl. Um, again, they were, you know, allowed to pet her, allowed to feed her, you know, food just like you would like an animal. Um, and then on the bottom here, you have three women. Um, this is in France. So the little girl that this was in uh, in Belgium, and these three women uh, actually were in France. This zoo actually still exists. It doesn't exist, obviously, in in this form. Um, you know, in terms of the human zoo, but there are still um, reports of human zoos around the world. I think as recently as 2005 or 2006, um, I believe in Germany, there was a recreation of an African village where they essentially placed people of African um, uh, descent in, the, in this village and people were allowed to observe them in nature. Um, so these, these zoos still somewhat exist, um, you, you know, even in the current day. And so where the, the idea of don't touch my hair or the idea that someone would be able to come and touch your hair, perhaps you may not necessarily be explicitly aware um, of this, but there you will see as I go along that there is some sort of a pattern that maybe contributes to the fact that people feel that, yeah, like if I see something that, you know, that interests me, that I can just go in and touch it, even though it belongs to a person, it's actually a person. Um, so my question to you all, and again, you can unmute or whatever, but my question to you all is, what part do you think that this history plays in how we relate to um, Black women in terms of their appearance, what we see about them, um, the, you know, their hair, the, the curiosity about how they look. Do you think that there is a correlation um, in some way to how we interact with Black women on that level? Anyone can feel free to, to unmute. I know it's a very uncomfortable conversation, isn't it? Yeah, Dr. Darko, this is Christine Stevens. I think it is that uh, black women are always treated as other, mm -hmm. not the norm, always as other. I think that's what comes to mind for me. Yeah, exactly, right? And the other makes them just more interesting and more appealing and more kind of, you become more curious about them. And so, you know, again, even if you are not explicitly aware of, you know, the zoo, um, you know, and, and how they existed, 
the the question becomes does this nuance right does this nuance of the curiosity of how black women look does that continue in other ways in the culture right that we currently live in um, and it, it may pop up in, in many different ways. Sometimes people will say like even in music videos or, um, you know, exotic, you know, ex exotic uh, images on TV or in magazines, right? That this kind of, you know, display, if you will, continues on in that way. Um, anyone else have any thoughts about that? So the Jan? I see, yeah. I saw your hands yeah. up. I just happened to, to see your hands up. So it, what it reminded me of was I saw a movie called The Long Song and it's about the rebellions on the plantations, um, the sugarcane plantations. And one of the things that was portrayed in that movie was how the slaves were handled, their physical being mm -hmm. handled without any respect for you know, their privacy or anything like that. And I wonder if maybe that's somehow carried through. I don't know. I mean, I don't think, I don't know. Yeah, that's it's it's hard to, it's hard to say. I, I'm glad you actually brought that up because that that actually is going to probably go to my next point is that, right, there, there, you know, obviously here, there is a blatant disregard, right, for someone's humanity. There's a blatant disregard for, um, a person's ability to own themselves and, and what they do, right? So, you know, the, again, the, the whole other idea, um, and if you are an other, then what does that mean, right? What does that mean in terms of your relationship in society and how you are depicted and how you are placed and what your role is in society? And again, these things may not necessarily be as explicit but there are some implicit um, notions of this that continue, that perpetuate, I think, in, in our society. And so, you know, in, in, in looking at or engaging in this presentation, what, what I guess my, um, you know, what I'm trying to convey to you is that this is a reality for Black women, right? And that you may not necessarily be even aware of this. And so, you know, it's important when we're having these, these discussions that if you're not aware of these things that you don't necessarily dismiss it because, well, I've never seen this before. So it's not happening. You know, it, it is happening, it has happened and it continues on again in very nuanced ways. Dr. Carilla, hi, Dr. Carilla. Hi, Renee, how are you? I'm good, it's been so long. Oh, it's so good to see you though. I was so excited you were coming. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. It strikes me as the whole idea of the objectification, objectification of women across the board mm -hmm. and most horribly and, as, and certainly the difference as far as objectification of someone different, whether it be the female or male African-American or any Latino, any, anybody different is objectified. Right. And it struck me that that really is is bred by the sense of entitlement of whoever seems to be the top dog in the hierarchy of whatever society we're talking about. And the fact that you are so entitled, you can invade people's spaces and you can point at them and look at them and touch their hair for heaven's sakes. And it reminds me of the common thing about women who are pregnant and everybody in the yes. world thinks they own their belly for heaven's sake. Yes. It's just absurd to me. Yes. And the whole, like, the whole underpinning of lack of respect. Right, right. And I think, thank you so much for that, Dr. Carilla, because I think that when you, especially when you put it in the context of, you know, pregnant women and people come up and they just touch their bellies, I think that helps people to really, really understand like, oh, is that what you mean by don't touch my hair? Like, yeah, that's what I mean. Like that sense of, that belly belongs to me or that belly is something that I can touch and I don't have to ask you for that. It's that same notion um, of entitlement, like you mentioned, to, to just be able to invade someone's space. Um, and so speaking of, in, of objectification, so <laughs> one of the things that I always kind of, you know, talk about is the advancements that medicine has actually benefited from because of 
you know, racism, prejudice, bias, sexism, right? We just see it all throughout medicine. But what's really funny is that, you know, at, we, we see things from two different lenses in medicine. Like we see the objectification, but then in the modern day, we try to say, well, but you know, how could structural racism exist? Because, you know, doctors are, are not necessarily racist or biased or sexist or prejudiced. But, you know, we live in a society, right? Doctors are not born and bred in a specific uh, environment with specific types of people so that they are washed of any sort of bias and, and prejudice, right? Like that doesn't necessarily happen. And so when we look at the history of medicine here on the left, we see J. Marion Sims, who is an obstetrician gynecologist like myself, um, and he literally took enslaved women and did unindicated procedures on them um, without their consent and without anesthesia, right? Something we wouldn't even do to our dogs, right? Like we would say, no, if you're going to cut my dog open, you should, you know, put my dog under and give my, my dog an anesthetic. Like we wouldn't want to see our dogs suffer like that. Um, and so you can see that essentially they are objectifying her, right? They're looking at her as if she is some sort of object, some sort of specimen. And then you can see the, the, the other women all the way to the left, just looking and knowing that they cannot necessarily protest lest they risk their lives. But what they're doing is that they're not protesting so that they don't risk their lives, just so that they can have or give J. Marion Sims the opportunity to risk their lives, right? So it's the irony of it. Um, and so, you know, there were women who had, you know, 10, 20, multiple um, unnecessary procedures done on them just for the sake of honing the skill, honing um, the profession of obstetrics and gynecology. Um, so, you know, there we see definitely the objectification and that it did cause some sort of advancement in medicine. That was, that was the result of it, which is, you know, why he is called the father of gynecology. He's, he's actually celebrated for that. Um, and then on the right, we have Henrietta Lacks. Um, if you've ever heard of HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks was uh, actually, I think she died in 1951. Uh, but she died of advanced cervical cancer. She lived in Maryland and her family were uh, a bunch of tobacco farmers, which probably led to her, at least contributed to her advanced uh, cervical cancer. But her cells uh, were taken by a physician at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Maryland, um, again, without her consent. And those cells in that time, it was very, very hard for them to grow cells um, for you know, technological advancement of um, medications and different diseases and things like that. But her cells are literally considered immortal. Um, her cells are still growing today. We're talking about from late 1940s, early 1950s until today. Those cells are actually still growing and have been distributed literally throughout the world. Um, for the advancement of medicine, different medications, gene therapies, all kinds of um, advancements in medicine. And so kind of like what Dr. Carilla mentioned, the objectification um, of women in general, but certainly women who are seen as lesser than, right? Lesser value. Um, they tended to even go further beyond what potentially they could have gotten away with had this been, you know, someone who was not of lesser value. So any any discussion, further discussion about this, I see, is it asthma? You had your, yes. your hands up, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Darko, for <clears throat> this presentation. And I'm having actually some trouble talking about this. So usually I'm a talker, but I think, you know, it's gonna take a lot of courage for me to really be honest uh, to everybody here but you know I just wanted to comment on the previous picture of you know the women displayed in zoos I mean that yeah. is so painful you know as, as women we you know we cover our bodies we have private parts and you know we have our own space and to put that on display is just like 
you know, people use the, Dr. Kirla used the word objectification. I'm going to use the word inhumane. Like right. these people were subhuman. They were right. not even human. I mean, as families, men used to, you know, now and always like, you know, they were supposed to be protecting the honor of women and, you know, the girls, the wives, the women, the family, and to put them on display is just something I don't really have words for, for it. Uh, but this particular slide that you put on, I actually recently read a book called The Medical Bondage, mm -hmm. and it describes all of the OBGYN, and they were all males, incidentally, in the field who experimented on these slaves. And there was a woman who, like, they performed like 30 surgeries on mm -hmm. this woman to perfect the technique. Uh, oftentimes without anesthesia, and and you know if she uh, complained, they were like you know, you're not supposed to feel the pain, right? Because right. you're not human. It was right. so, I couldn't finish the book. It was just so, so, you know, just- Horrendous. Horrendous, just yeah. difficult. Uh, so I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I, you make a very good point. Thank you for that. You make a very good point, especially about the pain, right? So now what's happened is as recently as 2016, Many of you may be aware that there was a study of medical students and residents, right? Fourth year medical students and residents um, who were asked about pain control for African-American versus white women. And so two questions actually stood out to be significant. And one was essentially the pain tolerance, right? Do, are the nerve endings of black women, you know, less sensitive um, than white women. And so the, the answer was yes. They said yes, that it, that it is. And then they asked, do Black women or do Black people have thicker skin than white people? And they answered yes. They answered yes. Now, I will tell you that there isn't a medical textbook, at least not a modern medical textbook that I am aware of, <laughs> Um, that actually says that the answer is yes to this. So where do these students come up with that notion? And not only one student or two students, but a significant number of students and residents, people who've actually graduated from, from medical school, right? So physicians actually are bringing this notion into their own practices. And so we see that even in obstetrics and gynecology, that while Black and Hispanic women actually report higher levels of pain in pregnancy-related pain, postpartum pain, you know, after C-sections, they actually get less pain medication than white women who actually report lesser amounts of pain. So, you know, again, you may not necessarily be aware of a certain history in order to perpetuate it. And so the, the question is, where is this, where are these notions seeping into our culture? Like, where do we think that this is coming from that even younger people in 2016 have these notions? And so it's, it's, it's getting in somewhere. Anybody have any thoughts about how this may be being perpetuated, how people are actually still believing these things. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> it's, it's a tough question, right? Um, but somewhere along the line, they're being, they're being taught that, right? Taught, when I say taught, not explicitly, but they are being taught it in some implicit way. I think just to jump in real quick, I think one thing that, you know, a lot of times people, try to invalidate when someone says about microaggressions or small right. comments. And I think, uh, you know, the buildup of microaggressions, they might not seem like those one-off comments are that impactful, but if you hear them, they can influence a lot of things, especially if you're not well-informed. So having, you know, some older relative or someone at the, you know, mm -hmm. you're at the beach saying that a black woman's not going to get a sunburn or something like that, right. that might stick with you your entire life. And so mm -hmm. these very false statements that people think are just throwaway comments build up. That's a really good point, actually. That's a really good point. You know, over time, you just hear kind of little, you know, little comments here and there, and eventually you take them as truth. 
And so you pass them all, you pass them along as well, right? And it's it's a societal thing almost, right? Where everybody's making these little comments and eventually it becomes part of the culture. Um, so it's just really scary how things can actually seep in to our society without us ever necessarily deliberately doing it, at least not at this point, right? With, with the zoos, that was deliberate. Like that was absolutely deliberate. Um, but when we're talking about implicit biases, right? Where people are just, you know, casually making comments, it's, it's very scary um, that it can get to the point where if you graduate from medical school, you can actually still have these beliefs. Dr. Johnston. <laughs> Dr. Darko, I just wanted to say thank you for, uh, for this presentation and particularly for coming back home. Thank uh, you. Being an alum, uh, we're always welcome to have you. Um, I had a couple thoughts. Number one, I had no idea that there was anything like a human zoo. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's an embarrassing type of topic for uh, yours truly to even think about. Um, and I... I just, uh, it's hard to fathom. Right. But, um, the reality is, um, you know, we were fortunate as we grew up. Uh, my parents always told me to treat everybody equally. Right. And I was raised, as many are, to treat uh, a lady like a lady. And we never had any thoughts of any of the other components like pain thresholds and thickness of skin, et cetera. And I, I just think, Renee, that there's been so much that's been suppressed. That now is a time that it's coming to more fluidity, more dialogue, and for goodness sakes, for peace uh, relevant to uh, uh, civility. Uh, how we treat people is very important as how we're moving forward. You know, we look back at our past and there's just certain things that we've got to move forward mm -hmm. in order to make our lives richer not monetarily, but of right. value, right. personal humanistic qualities. And uh, to think of all the atrocities that have been done in the past, it's, uh, it's inhumane, yeah. but it was done. To think you're gonna get rid of culture, uh, there are things that, and that's the current movement today, is yeah. to get rid of what we've had in the past. Right. Um, but that um, culture is, is, is part of why we're here today. Yeah. So it's your generation, our generation, and the youth that are coming behind us that are going to change it. Um, and now's the time to make a transitional change for it. So, um, you know, even in today's society, even as you go to medical school, um, we, we try to base an applicant's um, application, I should say, on their uh, merit, their achievements, and certainly not on their class or their gender or their wealth. And objectivity should prevail in that setting. However, sometimes just subjective thoughts come about when you're talking to an applicant. Right. Well, Renee, I want to say thank you very much for what you're talking about, having the courage to talk about it, bringing up some tough topics that are difficult to discuss, but definitely worth further dialogue. So welcome home. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Johnston. And by the way, I make I, I often tell a joke that you told when we were in school and you, you know, you told us how, how can you tell whether or not, you know, a patient is, you know, being genuine with you and you ask them, does it hurt here when you pee? <laughs> <laughs> well, the other ad, the other part of that is being teeth itch. And uh, that's so right, do your teeth itch. Don't forget it, don't forget that one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
yeah, I mean, it's so important to, to learn that we need to move on from these things. And, you know, to, to move on to these things sometimes means knowing that they actually exist and understanding where, you know, where they are perpetuated so that you don't repeat it, right? The whole notion of, you know, you're, you're doomed to repeat history if you, if you don't know it. Yep. Dr. Carilla. Thank you. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm always glad to see you come home. Um, it struck me as far, and you touched on it a little bit, that we need to move forward, but we can't forget the backwardness that we've had right. because we are doomed to repeat it. And that's something that is so often forgotten. And some people, you know, will talk a really strong argument about, um, you know, betrayal and reimbursement and making it right. Those hideous things can't possibly be made right. Those are too hideous to be able, you know, as Ozma referred to, I mean, it's, it's unspeakable, it's horrific, but we are obligated to know about them, learn about them more mm -hmm. and to move in a direction that doesn't let them happen again. Right. But also I think that the whole Henrietta Lacks and um, the other case that you mentioned and the, the, the multitudes of surgeries without anesthesia the end does not justify the means. Right. And that whole ethical question that should be overarching for so many things in our lives. Right. And, and to step back a minute and look at some of those things. Yeah. And yes, you don't, you don't forget those things because if you did learn something, then you may have learned what not to do. Right. But, you know, and, and move on, but you just can't fix everything either. You've got to start working at chipping away what we've got. Yeah, absolutely. Thank absolutely. Thank you. I didn't know if anyone else had a hand up. There's only a few of you that I can see on the screen at a time. So if there's anyone who has anything to say, feel free to, to jump in there. Um, but Dr. Carilla, you, you must have made this, uh, this presentation with me because you keep going to the next thing, right? And you say, well, does the end justify the means, right? Is the objectification even worth it, right? Did it, did it really justify the means? Well, I think we know the answer to that. But additionally, additionally, there is the phenomenon that, you know, we know that while all of these things happened um, to women, particularly to Black women, that surgeries were honed and procedures were honed and, you know, uh, cancer cells were, were grown and, and so many different medications and technologies came um, from all of these things that the extra thing is that even the black women who live today don't necessarily benefit from the horrendous treatment of their ancestors, right? Of the, of, of black women in the past. So when we look at maternal mortality, for example, you know, maternal mortality in the United States is already, I mean, even amongst white women, it's already questionable. Okay. Um, we don't know why this is happening. Um, but certainly amongst black women, even with college degrees, right? Because we could easily say, well, you know, it's socioeconomic, you know, it's about education. Well, when we look at women and we factor in socioeconomic factors, we realize that Black women have five times more chances of dying in childbirth in this country. You know, that's, that's really, really scary, um, especially when you look at income. And I can tell you as someone who was recently pregnant, that one of the things that I was deathly afraid of was actually dying in childbirth. Like I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, but I was scared that my race put me at such higher risk that I literally made provisions for my husband. He, he didn't know it at the time, but I set up things in the house just in case I didn't come home. Um, and that's, you know, that's the trauma of it, right? Like that's the traumatic part of it. 
um, is that we're going into this and we're looking at these statistics and we're actually thinking this could be me. Um, and so I have a number of friends who, you know, have that same thought of, well, what if I don't come home? Um, and so, you know, it, it's just very scary. Um, so the objectification, while it may have benefited white women more, relatively speaking, it certainly did not benefit black women um, in the way that you would have expected, right? You're working on black bodies, therefore, you know, you're going to think that in, in the future, black bodies will do better. Um, and that didn't necessarily happen. And we see that with um, mortality rates in cervical cancer as well, right? That the the uh, mortality rates for black women, you know, significantly higher in comparison to their white counterparts. Um, so, you know, we didn't necessarily make the strides um, across the board anyway, the way that we would have expected. Um, and again, part of it is there is something in our society that is just seeping in. Um, certainly there, there may be some socioeconomic factors, but when you do correct for that and the number is still as high as it is, the question is, what is it? What is it? So any, any thoughts about, about this, right? Now, I mean, we kind of talked about the past, but now we're talking about the present um, and what, what potentially we are either doing to contribute to this or not doing to contribute to this. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's hard, <laughs> right? It's really difficult, um, you know? So I, I would say the objectification was not worth it in the long run, obviously. Um, it would have been better if, you know, if women in general could have been seen as the keeper of their own bodies. We know that that is something that we struggle with even today in our policies as to whether or not women are the keepers of their own bodies. You know, are you being forced to have an ultrasound before um, a termination? Are you not being granted um, a termination um, because, you know, of whatever reason, you know, maybe in your state, um, they don't offer the termination at a certain point in time. Um, you know, tubal ligations, um, birth control, you know, are you not allowed um, to get birth control from your local pharmacy because your pharmacist does not believe in birth control? Um, these things do actually exist, right? You go to the pharmacy, you give a script and they say, well, this is for birth control. We, I, I'm not going to give this to you because I don't believe in this. And it's like, well, what do you do? What if that's the only pharmacy in your town? Yeah, Jan, I see, I see Jan is like, what? Yeah, that, the, there are policies, there are laws um, that protect uh, people from giving birth control because they don't believe in it. Um, but what about the protection of the woman? What if maybe you're taking birth control because you're afraid to get pregnant because of a medical condition, right? And so now you're being denied that. And so when you get pregnant, now you're being denied access, you know, to a, a termination. So, you know, all of these things come into play um, in objectifying um, women's bodies such that they don't belong, you know, not all of your body belongs to you is, is a major problem in our society. Yes, Asma, yeah. So I'm, I'm not a psychologist and I may not be able to explain this fully, but uh, among the psychologists, there's a lot of discussion occurring these days about uh, generational trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the trauma that our ancestors experience somehow is passed off to the offspring as if it's like a genetic or epigenetic phenomenon. Epigenetic, I don't right. know how that works, but it surely, I mean, we were seeing that. And yeah. so I, I, maybe you could shed a little bit more light on that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, um, that's a question actually that I have. I actually did a, a presentation for Des Moines University um, a couple of weeks ago, and we, we touched a little bit upon epigenetics, right? The idea that trauma can be passed on, right? Does, does trauma um, change your genetic makeup um, such that you are experiencing, you know, racism, sexism, any type of oppression, and then passing that on 
to your offspring such that yeah. now you have an entire generation that is experiencing this. And then I would also, I would also argue that it might not just be trauma that is passed on, right? It might also be entitlement, right? This mm -hmm. idea of privilege that, you know, just as much as trauma affects you, entitlement also affects you. The, the feeling that, no, I belong in this world. I walk this earth. No one can stop me. I can do whatever I want. You know, that is passed on as well. And we know that we, we see that sometimes generationally with, with, you know, entire families who feel like, you know, you're like, what's wrong with this family that they think that they can just do whatever they want. Um, you know, and that that's on a very micro level, but certainly that can potentially be passed on very generationally. Um, so, you know, epigenetics, I think is, I, you know, I think it's still emerging. Um, I don't know that you can prove epigenetics exists. It certainly is a, a, a very interesting theory, but I would say that there's probably enough evidence that points to um, the possibility that epigenetics is, is a real phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the next, you know, the next kind of topic is stereotypes um, and the question of who's deservant, right? Who is deservant? Um, and I can tell you, you know, from uh, you know, going into residency, going out into practice, you know, um, especially when it comes to obstetrics. I mean, you, you see a lot of different dynamics, you know, a lot of different dynamics amongst people who are caring for patients, you know, um, I was often told, you know, oh, you know, you're, you're not the patient's social worker, just, you know, do what you have to do, you know, and get this patient out of here. Um, but I, I just could not operate like that, right? Like that, first of all, I wasn't trained like that at KCU. That's not the way that we were trained. Um, and so for me, again, looking holistically at the patient was extremely, extremely important to me. So I would spend a little bit more time with my, with my patients than perhaps, you know, my MD counterparts or my, you know, other um, fellow residents. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes I was dinged for that, like you, you know, you gotta move faster, you know? <laughs> and so um, part of that also was the notion that some patients were more deservant of my time than others. So in medicine, sometimes you will hear about the VIP patient, right? Like this patient is VIP um, or a patient who has an IVF pregnancy. Um, this is a VIP pregnancy. I'm like, no, it's an IVF pregnancy. You're using the wrong <laughs> letters. <laughs> so there's no such thing as a VIP pregnancy. Every baby is worth the effort. Like every single baby, whether you paid to conceive or not, every baby is worth the effort. Um, so here, what you see um, is kind of the stereotype, right? Um, this was a, uh, an experiment, if you will, a study that was done where the, uh, I guess the participants watched a news, like a news segment. And within the news segment, they actually had um, a, a story about being on welfare. And during the segment, they showed a set of participants, this woman, um, her name was Rhonda, um, and they showed, then they showed the other participants, this woman who also was named Rhonda, right? So you were only seeing one or the other, you didn't see both. And so the question was in terms of welfare, was it more negatively or more positively uh, depicted uh, in the minds of the people who saw the segment based on who they saw. And I think you all can kind of guess <laughs> um, what the answer was, right? There were definitely more negative feelings around um, welfare and entitlement programs um, with the black Rhonda than with the white Rhonda. And actually watching the, the white Rhonda actually elicited more negative feelings towards black people on welfare. And, you know, they couldn't really pinpoint why, but the, the thought process was, you know, that um, because, you know, be, because black people 
are thought of as, you know, welfare queens, right? And they're, you know, they're chucking the system and they're, you know, they're doing things that are illegal. They're having babies just to be on welfare. That now um, there's this negative idea of, of Black people, even though they saw white Rhonda, because white Rhonda is more of a sympathetic figure. She actually needs to be on welfare. She actually, you know, needs it for her children. She's entitled to this. She's not bucking the system. She actually is, you know, trying to do better for her family. Whereas, you know, a black person is, is literally just trying to get over on the system. Um, and so the question of being a, a person of lesser value, right, comes into play. And we see that in medicine, but we also see that in the workforce where literally of lesser value can be enumerated, right? So here we have men for every dollar, okay? Already women make less, right, as a category. But then if you're a black woman, you make even less. If you're Hispanic or Latino, right, you make even less. If you're Asian, you make slightly more actually than a woman in general. And then if you're Native American, um, you, you, know, you make less. Um, and so there, there is actually a, an enumeration to this thing where you can say, yeah, people are of lesser value. You put your money literally where your, your, your mouth is or where, you're, where you think your worth is. Um, so any thoughts about just kind of um, the whole welfare queen, other stereotypes, um, when it comes to uh, looking at not just women, but women of different ethnicities, in particular, in this case, um, Black women, um, and how potentially that can affect the, the wage gap. Anybody have any ideas about that? Why potentially we're seeing that? I mean, you know, even even white women, again, as a category, like 0.79, I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty significant. Um, so, you know, it again, who is deserving? Or do you deserve to get the dollar? You know, and the answer is obviously no, right? The people are saying, no, you don't deserve to get the dollar. The white man deserves to get the dollar, but you don't. I will tell you that um, in my last practice that I was in, um, my partner, she was the chair of the department. Um, and I had actually come into the department and I found her there. Um, she had been the chair of the department for about, ooh, I wanna say maybe five or actually seven years at that point. We had, another, um, we had another partner come in. It was a gentleman and he wasn't doing full range OBGYN. He actually was not really doing deliveries much. He was doing kind of urogynecology. He was a, a subspecialist, uh, but nonetheless, he joined, he joined our, our program. And it was later revealed that he was making $50,000 more than my partner, 50,000 out the gate. Um, and she was livid. You know, she was absolutely livid because she was doing full range OBGYN. She was on call. She was doing deliveries and she was the chair of the department, which means she had a lot more administrative work um, than, than any one of us. And so, you know, the question of why does this man come in um, and out the gate get $50,000 more than I do? And so she actually had to fight to get that $50,000 more. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is, why are women seen, you know, as lesser value? Um, do we, you know, is, is it just the lens of how men see us? Um, are we portraying something, you know, like what, what's the issue? Have, have we embodied, right? Have we actually been indoctrinated in what society sees of us to the point where we don't necessarily advocate for ourselves? And, and then we're subject to these wage gaps. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge question um, and we see it all across the board, not just in different, uh, not just in uh, professions outside of medicine, but we do see this in medicine as well. But I did want to end on a good note, right? So we have had strides in medicine. Um, we see Rebecca Crumpler, 
um, who was the first black female physician in 1864. And then Meta Christie, who's a PCOM graduate in 1921. And then obviously we all know Dr. Barbara Ross Lee, um, who was the first black female uh, dean of a medical school. Um, so we have made some strides and you know, I didn't want to end on gloom and doom. Um, I certainly think that there's a lot of work to be done, um, you know, as far as uh, academic medicine in particular, I think there's a lot of work to be done because that is where we're encountering our students who then become residents, who then become attendings. I think that there's so much that can be done in that time. Um, I don't know that you can, you know, deconstruct everyone's prejudice. I don't know that you can do that, but I do know that, like I said earlier, you know, when I was told by an attending, when I was a, when I was a resident, you are not your, your patient's social worker. No, I'm not my patient's social worker, but I do know that my indoctrination, if you will, into medicine from KCU, that, that education taught me that I have to look at my patient's mind, body, and spirit. And so that's what I go into um, medicine with. That's how I approach every single patient. I don't blow people off because I have other things to do or I'm just not interested in your story. And maybe, you know, we can use our, um, we can use the setting of academia to be able to, to at least help people to see where their biases are. And maybe, maybe, I'm hopeful guys, <laughs> maybe they can just check some of that at the door. So what can, what can academic, the academic world do, right? And here are some of the things that they are doing. Um, cultural competency training, okay? Anti-racism curricula um, have come into vogue. And let me tell you something, that word anti-racism, first of all, let me tell you, that's a big stride right there, okay? People don't like the word racism. I don't know if you all listened to the latest JAMA uh, podcast that was put out. I believe Michael Katz was on and um, the editor uh, in chief uh, from JAMA. But that, <clears throat> excuse me, that episode came under fire. And part of the reason that episode came under fire was because the word racism, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna get a drink of water the word racism was trying to be pushed under the table. <coughs> Sorry, it's really dry in here. <coughs> All right. So, um, whew. hold on one second. <laughs> I can I can just jump in while you cough if that'll yeah, help. Yeah, please. <laughs> I just I'll put on mute for a second. That there is a, a, a regular presentation through Eventbrite by the African American Policy Forum, um, and they are amazing people, and they talk a lot about their, you know, what's going on in terms of economically medically, legally, all kinds of things. They have all these brilliant people from all over the country who come and talk about, uh, and they have these, you know, uh, panel discussions and it, it's just amazing. So if anybody wants to tune into that, it's a good idea. Are you Thank okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for that save, Jan. <laughs> You're the real MVP. So um, yeah, I would I would definitely um, <clears throat> excuse me recommend that um, if you have a chance to listen uh, to the podcast episode that I was referring to in JAMA, um, it again it came under fire because you know I think like Dr. Johnston said like there are things that we have to we have to acknowledge, and you know, Dr. Krilla said the, you know, pretty much the same thing. There are things that we have to know, we have to acknowledge, um, so that we can actually move on. Because if we don't acknowledge these things, if we push things under the rug, then what happens is we sit in our own comfort zones. And the reality is that race relations is not comfortable. It, it just is not. 
You know, it, it's the unfortunate reality um, of our world, not just our nation, but of our world. Race relations are not comfortable. And so just the way that you would push past anything else that is uncomfortable, you have to push past the fact that these conversations make us feel un make us feel uncomfortable. You know, this is not a very comfortable conversation for me to have, but I know that I have to have it because if not, then how do I learn? How do I teach my children? How do I teach my students um, that you know we need to look at these things and understand that they actually exist, right? It's kind of like closing your eyes. No, you don't have leukemia. No, you you don't have it. You know, this is an ill of society. It's not an, a, a physical ill, but it is a, an ill of society. And um, if, you, if you skirt around it, then you run the risk that it will perpetuate itself and it will flare um, and it will literally kill you, right? So um, I see Dr. O'Connor, you had your hand up. Yeah, just going back to, um, uh, I just heard a podcast on Dr. Crumpler over the weekend, and I had no idea, and it sounded like uh, Boston University School of Medicine didn't have an idea that she right. was a graduate, and, um, and it was interesting, they, they, uh, she was given the title of Doctoress of Medicine, so even then, there was a, a distinction made here, right? Yes. It took her a long time to, maybe never, to earn uh, the respect of her colleagues, and and she did amazing work. It was a really fascinating um, podcast. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta does one, Coronavirus Factor Fiction versus Fiction, and was on that. Mm. Really quite interesting. So just so you brought her up, it was, it was uh, enlightening as well. And thank you again for being with us today. I really do appreciate yeah. it. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I actually didn't know that, um, the, the whole doctorous thing. Like that, even that, like it's like, yeah. Like why, you know, <laughs> she's learning the same medicine as everybody else, right? And so there has to be that distinction, that other, right. um, to make sure that, you know, we we don't confuse it. You know, <laughs> we should we should not conflate what she does with what everyone else does. So, uh, Dennis, you had a question or a yeah. comment? You know, I, I was curious. Um, I agreed with most everything or perhaps everything that was said today, but I was curious to what extent you used the challenges that you described as your motivation. I heard Steph Curry's mom, for example, say that that was her motivating thing. And I've had, I've got some good friends and that was their motivation. They weren't going to be as good as they were going to be better than mm -hmm. that was their idea was the secret to success was to motivate themselves to be better than. And then the follow up point or question that I had relates to the concept of fair. I, I've, when I get out in the community and discuss things, you know, irrespective of, of race or, or gender, I encounter people that go, well, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you want to affect change, what's, what's your definition of fair? Yeah, those are two good points. Um, you know, the, the, so to address your first point um, in terms of, you know, being better than and, you know, being greater than, certainly there is, you know, there is the idea of, you know, meritocracy and just being the best that you possibly can and, and doing things based on merit. Um, but we also, I think, have to acknowledge that there are barriers, right? There, there are certainly barriers um, that come into play so that even if you are putting your best foot forward, perhaps you're putting your best foot forward in the sense that you have to come, you have to overcome such a major obstacle that someone else coming from a, you know, from a more privileged background does not necessarily have to, you know, have to, to do. So for example, um, you know, when, excuse me, when you leave your house, right? When you leave your house, especially at night and you go to, let's say a gas station, you know, one of the things that you might think about is, okay, well, how much gas do I need? You know, do I have my money? Do I, you know, whatever. However, I will tell you that a black man going to a gas station at night is not just thinking about does he have enough money? Um, does he have, you know, how much gas does he need? He's thinking about what he's wearing. If he's wearing a hoodie, should he put the hoodie over his head? It's cold outside. 
but I can't put the hoodie over my head because I appear threatening. Um, you know, what, what do I do if I get stopped by the police, right? Do I have to code switch, right? Do I have to code switch? Meaning, do I have to speak in a different dialect, if you will, right? In the, you know, in the Queen's English, if you will, so that the officer understands that, you know, I'm not necessarily up to no good, right? So these are, these are different hurdles that people actually have to go through that, perhaps you may not necessarily even think about, and that's in the everyday world. We're not even talking about going over the hurdles um, that come with education, right? Coming from a neighborhood potentially where, um, you know, you have books that are 10 years old, but you're still expected to take the standardized tests that everybody else is taking. Um, you know, so we're, we're not even talking about those particular hurdles because certainly um, they do exist. And so that's where the question actually of fairness does come up, right? Because what is perpetuated, right? What is perpetuated? Um, you know, is it fair when you get to the point of college that if you had to go through the hurdles of working through having, a, having books that are 10 years old, but you didn't necessarily do as well on your standardized tests, whereas someone went to you know, lived in a neighborhood where their school was just almost as good as a prep school. And they had the latest technology and they had everything um, at their disposal, right? The question becomes, okay, well, is it 100% is it fair to, to compare them, you know, on, on the same exact level? Because they're literally coming from two different backgrounds. They're not necessarily coming from the same, you know, from the same backgrounds and they're not they don't have the same start. So even though they both might have finished high school, the question is, yeah, but you might have finished high school, but are you 10 yards ahead of me? Um, what, you know, what is actually fair? So we have to start thinking about, again, those things that are perpetuated over time. Oftentimes people will say, well, slavery's over. So, you know, that's it. You know, it, it was, it's over. Uh, we had a black president, so there's no more racism. And it's like, uh, just look around you. <laughs> there are remnants of all of that that perpetuate and permeate through society. And, you know, I would say just as hard as people say that people have to work to get over their hurdles, I would say that people need to put in the same effort to get rid of those hurdles, right? Get rid of those policies, right? Like a society also has the uh, responsibility to work very hard so that everyone in its society can have their fair share. So I would say that, you know, it's not just an individual responsibility. It's a societal um, responsibility for everyone to really just pitch in and say, okay, well, I need to do my part. I should not do things to perpetuate um, systemic or structural racism. You know, I myself may not go out and be prejudiced and discriminatory to people, but if I am taking advantage of, if I know that I can, um, you know, get some sort of privilege from a system, right, then I am contributing in part to that structural racism, to that structural discrimination. Um, and so I think that we have to start thinking about it, not just on the individual level, but we have to start thinking about it societally as well, that that hard work needs to be put in, um, in, in, in every way. I hope that, I hope that answered your question. So, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just end on saying that, you know, I think that Medical schools um, have certainly done their, their part um, in trying to address these issues, right? To make sure that they have diverse, inclusive campuses, um, that equity does exist. What I would say though is this, that what I've noticed is a lot of medical schools do put emphasis on diversity and inclusion, but they tend to do it at the student level first, right? Making sure that um, the questions are answered on the application, right? Are, are, you know, tell me about a time that you've met someone with, um, with a difference, you know, in terms of ethnicity or religion or, you know, any sort of difference, right? They're asked in, in medical school interviews, um, the same types of questions. And those things are important. 
But I would argue that medical students don't set the tone on medical school campuses. They just don't, right? They're, they are on campus two, three years max, and then they rotate right? They rotate. And that's not to say they don't contribute to the culture of the campus, but they don't necessarily set the tone, right? The people who set the tone, I would say actually start with the staff, right? So the lunch lady who's been there for 25 years, the maintenance man who's been there for 15 years, the security guard who's been there for 10 years, right? Because they've been there for so long, we oftentimes don't necessarily think of these, uh, of these people as setting the tone for our campuses, right? Our faculty members who have been there for a very long time, they set the tone as well. They're not rotating. They are literally there. They're kind of like your welcome crew to say, hey, listen, this is what we do on this campus. This is how we do it. This is the culture of our campus. This is what we will tolerate. This is what we will not tolerate. Um, if, you know, if you feel a, a different way, perhaps this is not the place for you. Um, and then invite those students into that tone, into that culture to say, you know, again, like Dr. Johnson was saying, like Dr. Carrillo was saying, right? You know, you take your cues from your faculty members, you know, to really say, okay, you, you know, I'm in a place where I think, you know, I belong. Right. I'm in a place where when they talk about, for example, African-American uh, patients, right, that they're not talking so stereotypically about those patients. Right. When I walk across campus, you know, I have a security guard who isn't necessarily looking at me to see if I'm, you know, if I don't belong here, am I doing something? The executive secretary or executive assistant. Um, isn't necessarily calling security on me because, you know, I walked into the building and she, she's not comfortable with me, right? So these are the types of things, these are the types of experiences that students do have on college campuses, medical school campuses. And I would say that the anti-racism curriculum, while that's good um, on the student side, I would say there's a lot of work, I think, to be done on the staff and faculty side. And I don't know that you know every university is is involved in that, um, but that that would be my call to action um, is to really, really, really start looking at um, the staff and faculty and putting that same amount of effort and resource um, into making sure that you are it very intentional in building uh, the diversity, the diverse and inclusive campus that you want um, over time. So. I don't know what your thoughts might be about that, but that's kind of, that's all I have for you today, folks. <laughs> Dr. Darko, on behalf of everyone at KCU, thank you so much for this great presentation and discussion. Uh, there are many thank you notes in the chat and I'll thank make sure you, you see thank them. You. I'll pull the comments down and send your way so you can read them. Yeah, um, and happy actually. International Women's Day. Uh, I hope yeah, you get much deserved. Yes, I hope you get some much deserved rest after the 60 hour shift delivering babies this weekend. Um, and thank you so much for powering through and being such an engaging speaker. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so Renee. much, everyone. Thanks, Renee. Thank you so much, Dr. Han. I appreciate it. Take care, everyone. It was great. Thank you.